The following is an overview of a presentation on how to avoid pitfalls when choosing a new dental curing light. Today dentists face many challenges. Broad spectrum quartz tungsten halogen curing lights are being replaced by narrow spectrum LED curing lights that for the most part deliver no light below 420 nanometers. The trouble is some resin manufacturers are now using resins that require light in the 410 nanometer range. In addition, dental curing lights are becoming very powerful, and some of them claim one second curing times. Operators do not watch what they're doing when light curing because they don't want to damage their eyes. And finally, there's an influx of poorly designed, cheap LED curing lights on the market. Is this a problem? Well, in 2009, the National Institute for Dental and Craniofacial Research wrote that composites have an average replacement time of 5.7 years due to secondary caries and fracture of the restoration. Something's going on. Just last year, a paper was published in Dental Materials that showed how important it is to cure resin fillings, because if you don't cure them properly, they'll release more chemicals into the body. These are the most popular types of curing lights on the market, quartz tungsten halogen, plasma arc, and LED curing lights. We can see here that both of these lights deliver 900 milliwatts per centimeter squared. But you'll notice that the spectral emission is very, very different between these two lights. This can be a problem if the resin you're using requires light below 420 nanometers. Are there resins on the market that require these lower wavelengths? Yes. Here we can see tetric bulk fill, and the manufacturers make a point of saying that the new initiator provides a deeper depth of cure but it's most efficient at 412 nanometers. So if your light doesn't produce any light in that region, then potentially there's a problem. Here we can see a slide of the Smart Light Max LED curing light. And you'll note that this light claims fast five second curing times for some commonly used materials. Turning to the back side of this sheet, you'll see that, yes, that's true for aesthetics. B1 shade requires five seconds. But at the other end of the scale, TPH, shade C4, requires 35 seconds. That's a seven-fold increase in the curing time from five to 35 seconds. And dentists need to be aware that there are these huge ranges in curing times for composites made by the same resin manufacturer. I'd like to talk to you now a bit about beam profile analysis. This shows a beam profiler setup. You can see the camera on the left-hand side, and you can see the image of the light beam on the screen. Now the camera takes a picture of this image. Ideally, the light beam should have what has been called a perfect top hat. You can see the image on the left looks like a top hat. The irradiance is uniformly distributed over the tip of the curing light here. Unfortunately, most LED curing lights are not uniform. Here we see an example of a non-uniform curing light. In some spots, it only delivers an irradiance of 388 milliwatts per centimeter squared, whilst in other areas, it delivers almost 6,000 milliwatts per centimeter squared. And yet, when you look at this light on a dental radiometer, or on a power meter, or an integrating sphere, you'll see that the average irradiance is 1,300 milliwatts per centimeter squared. That number does not truly represent what is being delivered by this light to the dental resin. We've published a paper that shows that the spectral emission from curing lights can be related to the location of the LED chips. Here we can see an example of a curing light with three LED chips in it. You'll note that two are very bright, with lots of red in them, and one is kind of dull. What's happening here is that the two LED chips are delivering light in the 460 nanometer range, and the chip on the left is delivering light around about 410 nanometer range. The relevance of this is that if we take a bicuspid tooth, seven millimeters across, then we overlay it with the tip of the curing light, we'll see that not all areas of the tooth are receiving the wavelengths that you might expect from the curing light. It's very localized. Another factor to consider when getting a curing light is the effect of increasing the distance on the irradiance. Here we can see a curing light shining onto a surface. Now, as we increase the distance, you'll start to see the LED chips coming into focus. 
and at a slightly increased distance, you can very clearly see the LED chip there. This is an obvious case of beam non-uniformity. As the distance increases, the irradiance can decrease quite dramatically from some curing lights. Taking measurements that we have made in the laboratory and translating them to the tooth, we can see that a curing light that delivers 2,400 milliwatts per centimeter squared at the tip can very easily only deliver 850 milliwatts at the base of the proximal box. Every study that's been published has shown that many curing lights in dental offices are either damaged or have debris on the tip. And this can reduce the light output quite dramatically. Here we can see a curing light with some debris on the tip delivering just about 400 milliwatts per centimeter squared. And then when we clean the light tip, we see that the output increases to about 900 milliwatts per centimeter squared, just by the simple process of cleaning the light tip. Many dental offices are using baggies for infection control. Now we have found that these bags reduce the light output by about 10%. But this effect is even greater if the seam of the bag goes over the end of the light tip, or if there are folds in the bag. At Dalhousie University, we have developed a device that has now been sold by Blue Light Analytics that accurately measures how much light is delivered to simulated restorations in the mouth. Here we see a typical example of the light output delivered by a student. You see that the irradiance starts out very high and then gradually declines over time. We have published several papers. Here we can see a paper that was published just last year in the Journal of the Canadian Dental Association. As mentioned previously, it's very important to protect your eyes from the bright blue light. And the reason why this is so is because the most dangerous wavelengths to the retina are about 440 nanometers. And this is just in the range of the light output from our dental curing lights. In 2011, we published a paper evaluating the ocular hazards from four different types of curing lights. And in 2007, another author evaluated the efficacy of the eye protection filters used with dental curing lights and bleaching lamps. We have found that there is no danger as long as you use appropriate and correct eye protection. This does not mean wearing sunglasses, as these will not protect your eyes. To conclude, a single irradiance value does not adequately describe the output from a dental curing light. The beam profiles clearly show that. The spectral emission and where it is delivered across the face of the light tip is important, and this again is something that can be seen using a beam profiler. The irradiance delivered at clinically relevant distances is also very important. Whilst it's very beneficial to measure the irradiance of the light tip, you need to know how it performs over clinically relevant distances. Your light curing technique is of course very important, and there are ways that you can learn how to use your curing light most efficiently. Finally, it is very important to protect your eyes from the blue light hazard. You must wear appropriate eye protection so that you can watch what you're doing when you're light curing. Remember, you would never prepare a tooth without looking so in order to use the curing light properly, you have to watch what you're doing, which means you have to wear appropriate eye protection. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me.